This week on It's Not Easy Being Green, we're looking for ways to save the pennies. Jim, get your butt up to the pub. <laughs> Jim and I are banking on our local to give us some inspiration. Well, James has gone further afield in search of hip building materials, which don't cost the earth. It's actually quite a cheap way of building, which is always very good. Lauren's learning that a cardboard coffin isn't just good for the planet. This is about, um, I would say, a fifth of the price of a normal coffin. I have my reservations. <laughs> but there's nothing cheap about our eco guest, the very lovely Julian Ryan Tut. Go on, give us a snog. What's it like kissing you? Getting lost in a forest. Oh, you're not ready for that, mate. You're not ready. You're not ready for that. The local shops and the pub are at the heart of our Cornish community. But as credit gets crunched, they're really feeling the pinch. Fuel bills are a big part of the problem, but there are some simple green solutions. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and James and I are off to the pub. <laughs> we haven't actually been driven to drink, have we, mate? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and Chris are the landlords in our local pub, and the cost of their energy has gone up phenomenally. So we're here to see if we can help. So it's uh, James and Dick to the rescue. <laughs> I think. It's a bit early, isn't it? It is. <laughs> OK, straight to business. Bills, what are your big ones? Biggest is uh, gas and electric, with water a close third. And what are you using your most of your gas here? Most of the uses is in there, the cellar. <laughs> so the best thing to do is come and have a look. Yeah, yeah that's a good starting point. <laughs> Whoa. Hey. Inner sanctum. It is. <laughs> what, what are the main problems in here? Well, as you can see, you've got a unit like that which is kicking out cold. You've got a noise. You've got a unit there that supplies your beer, but that's kicking out heat. You've got this thing here, which has to be the ice for the ladies. That's kicking out heat. And there's <laughs> Looks like you've got a bit of a problem here as well. Warm, it's so warm I can see. wasting energy lights in the cellar. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing is, that's hot, this is hot, that's cold. We've got to come up with a cunning plan to sort this out. All right. Like any pub officer shop, Steve's lights are on all day. That's 14 hours non-stop, and it's costing him a small fortune. Got to have the right light for the right game. This big old building means his heating bills are through the roof. All right, up I go. <laughs> closely followed by James. How are we doing? Good, yeah. yeah. And how much? What's up there? Come on, talk to me. Well, actually, there's absolutely nothing up there, so it's hemorrhaging heat. You're going to be losing. It's a little bit like that. It's not wearing a hat in the cold. Your house it, is it, losing exactly all of that energy. Like that. So there's nothing at all. No. We need backup. It's a job for our techie mate. Jim, get your butt up to the pub. <laughs> yeah, I know it's <laughs> quarter past ten. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Jim's got his work cut out, but he knows how to save a bob or two. James, shouldn't you be somewhere else? People go green in business for all kinds of reasons. In Devon, Paul McDonald doesn't want to upset the neighbours. Yeah. Paul, nice to meet you. Hi, good to meet you. <laughs> this looks amazing. What, what exactly is going on here? What... Uh, well, we're building a sustainable sawmill here. Yeah. Um, we're having to build with straw bales, which we're very glad to do, um, for soundproofing, yeah. because we live close to um, a housing estate. And um, this is going to be our main sawmill building. We're just starting to build these walls here. Yeah. As you can see, we've put them down on these wall bases, which keeps them up off the wet. Yeah, and they're just going on uh, what spikes? Straight, yeah, onto these spikes here. Then as we go up, we have ladder frames that hold them onto the frames. Yeah. You can see it's a really tall it's building. huge building. Yeah. It and is, you're planning, it needs you're planning to be that all size. of this is going to be built with straw bales? All the way up. Straw is the most wonderful material to use for that because yeah. it's an industrial waste process, essentially. Yeah. It's a product that has very little value, and yet as a building medium, it's absolutely superb. And at the end of its life, you can actually just compost it. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah. there's no waste. Yeah. Straw bales can also be used on something as ordinary as a house extension. And doing just that in Yorkshire is Terry Wolfe. 
stubs go in here and we sit it onto it. Yeah. But we'll cut it out so that we fit right around oh, the right. door frame. Cool. Such a simple way of doing it, isn't it? But it's, right. it's sort of, yeah, really clever. But we got it. What stops the bale from coming apart when you chop it like well, that? Well, the strings are here. The, you don't touch the strings. All oh, right, so the string stays in place so you, the whole time. You cut between the strings. That's really cool. I like the idea of it because I like that I could get a local material. Yeah. Um, Two miles down the road. Exactly. In the field, yeah. Most bales, when you, you know, the, the way farmers are using them for horses or sheep or whatever, um, are actually too loose for our purposes for building. Yeah. They need to be quite dense. So unfortunately, you had to rebale them, and of course, I had to pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> So my actual cost was about four pounds a bale. So it's a bit more expensive than it would have been if I'd caught him sooner. Yeah. Shall we try this? Yeah. See what that's like. Even so, it still cost her less than bricks and mortar. Have we got the right side? It's um, pretty good. <laughs> and has another great benefit. It really is about its insulation. You know, superb insulation qualities. Yeah. We're hoping that with this build, I'll need almost no additional heating. Wow. <laughs> Each bale has to be cut to shape and dressed. So I've never dressed a straw bale before. <laughs> yeah, apparently um, spraying it off so that you get nice seals between the bales, which I guess is like, it's like insulation in your roof. You want to always like, not leave any air gaps, otherwise that's where you're going to get um, lots of heat. And fitting them is a precision job. We have a, a little hole right here in the middle. <laughs> Just a bit. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Once the structure's complete, it's coated with lime render to make it weatherproof. It's feeling wonderful, and it, it is kind of, you know, I've, I've spent two years looking at it on paper. Yeah. And it's now beginning to look real, and it's yeah. beginning to look like my house. Yeah. Um, so it's fantastic, absolutely wonderful feeling. Yeah. yeah, that's like a day I thought I wasn't sure when it was ever going to get here. <laughs> Straw houses are popping up all over the country. Some even look good enough to eat. They may look like something out of a fairy tale, but they are warm, comfortable, cheap to run and full of character. And bearing in mind that the cement industry is one of the world's worst polluters, it really is a 21st century solution. Two months later, the sawmill in Devon is up and running. At the moment, it looks like a, just a giant building made of straw. <laughs> well, it does, but it's actually a lot closer to finishing than you might think. Yeah. On the inside, it's basically plastering. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is the first thing we have to do is to give all this straw a trim. Yeah. And we'll do that with a strimmer or a chainsaw. Yeah. And then we put on um, the mixed uh, clay and chopped straw plaster. And then on the outside, we'll be um, covering that with weatherboard, which we're cutting with our saw. Right. <laughs> I actually, I saw the saw on the way in. I've never seen one working. Is there any well, chance we can yeah, fire it Yeah, there's absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. <laughs> You're going to need one of these, I'm right. afraid. It's pretty loud. <laughs> so this wood's going to be for the outside? It is, yes. It's really pretty loud. <laughs> Should we go out and give it a test? Yes, that would be good. So, as you can see, we've got the back of the sawmill here and the house just at the back here. It's the closest house. And it's no noisier than an average road. Um, <laughs> no, it's less noisy than an yeah. average road. And we're fact. talking about 100 metres to your neighbours. And yeah. all, all that noisy machinery is being kept completely quiet by, yes. the, by the building. And we haven't even got the windows in yet. When we started this project, we decided to stick to our principles and hopefully bear the costs. But what we've actually found is that sticking to our principles has given us actually a, a definite financial advantage. A conventional building would have cost us 80 to 90% more Whoa. than this building has cost us. Best of both worlds. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and um, it means I can sleep soundly in my bed at night. Um, so can the neighbours. <laughs> so can my neighbours yeah. and so can my accountant, yeah. which Excellent. is more to the point. Over the years, people have built all sorts of buildings out of straw. I wonder if anyone's ever built a bridge. Dad? Oh, James. I'm in London to visit another pub to meet our guest for the eco-test, Julian Ryan Tut. It's his local. 
Julian was last seen in Merlin trying to charm a princess. I may be able to help her. But is he helping the planet? Right. Oh. Footprint calculator, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Listen, You're shooting. Do we like the cardi or shall I lose it? No. Is it green enough? Have, it's like you're going to the allotment. I might have an allotment. Yeah. yeah. But I haven't really. <laughs> right. Okay. Footprint calculator, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Trust me. Yeah, I'm trusting you. Yeah. Complete honesty, because otherwise we'll find you out. Yeah. All right. First thing is, right. oh, what kind of vehicle do you uh, travel in? Motorbike, car? Interesting question. Come on, this is almost like it's it. Yeah, it's not okay. quite confessions, but what do, you, what, what, do you, what do you drive a ride? I've got a very, very large sports car. What is it? Made by Mercedes Benz. Okay, what size engine? <laughs> well, I'm going to put it on the table that it's five litres. In London, that's really useful. That's very, very useful. <laughs> and actually, motorbike as well. Now, I can't and I've got a motorbike. And you've got a motorbike. Ducati, 1000cc. Yeah, Get okay. it out there. It's okay, well, I'm going to put down car because yeah, that's okay. going to give you a worse score, all right? Okay. And your car, I have to go to the very bottom of this list oh, for a would. very large, large petrol large car. Large petrol car. In the last 12 months, personal air travel outside Europe. Oh, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Across the Atlantic, a couple of times. Yeah, OK, so that you're over yeah. 35 hours. In that, the air? Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. how would you best describe your uh, diet? Not very green. You like Omnivore. Yeah. I'll eat anything. Right, how often do you buy organic meat, vegetables and dairy products? Oh, do you buy organic? I'm looking at sometimes. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I do tend to buy quite a bit of organic veg. Uh, if I can find it at the right price. Yeah. But then live in you the don't constant... Worry. Listen, you don't worry about the price. Live... You're in a fast lane, mate. I have it brought to me. Occasionally <laughs> I ask my maid how much it costs. Well, and I suppose the next thing is, what about locally produced meat, vegetables and dairy products? That's you, tricky. You... I'm a bit of a supermarket man. <laughs> I'm not afraid to go to the supermarket. But do you actually look and do you see where, what is local? In that, yes. I'm, I'm a sucker for... I'm looking locally ..with a photograph of Ken. <laughs> With his cows on the label. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah Ken's oh, those big smiley faces, not yeah, cow. Yeah. His cow loves I them. just made this milk from this cow. Why don't you buy it now? Do you regularly turn off your lights and sort of turn off the standby switches and I things do, in your appliances? I've just reached that fascinating age where you switch from not caring about the lights to going, I'm going to turn that light off. Uh, it's a waste of Yeah, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, condensing boiler. Condensing boiler is the only way. I, I love my boilers. You know your way around this, doesn't he? Dad was a builder. Yeah. Uh, and right. uh, and his brothers. Yeah. Uh, I've Someone was rubbed I've, off. I'm fascinated by it. And uh, boilers are uh, strange, strangely interesting to me. Yeah. If you it's a very good investment. Here, Julian. How would you spend on yeah. bath and grooming products? Because the way your hair obviously gets well, soft. Well, obviously that is a professional expense. Yeah. Um, hair and uh, bath and grooming the, products the last 12 months. Tell me what the upper limit is, yeah. and we'll go. We'll, 300 we'll work pounds back. plus. 300 pounds plus. That's 30 pounds a month. Really. Well, it will be, I was going to say surprising, perhaps very unsurprising to know that uh, it takes an enormous amount of time, effort and money to, to, look, that to look this mediocre. So who are we, who are we kidding? Who are we kidding? I'm about to press the button and it's going to say how many planets it would take if everybody in the world lived like you live. Mm. Got a feel for of your, how much you're um, living above and beyond the resources we've got available? What do you reckon? I came in confident. I'm now thinking several galaxies. 3.84 planets. Now that's right. So we would have run out of planets. Yeah. If everyone lived like me. Travel comes with work, and the yes. sort of things we have to do. And um, it does. Uh, you know, and to be fair, you've got to look at how, how many people you make happy when you're off doing all these things. Yeah. I'm spreading, spreading happiness. Happiness, yeah. But, you know, but there's no price on that. Julian Ryan Tut, you are in the red. We'd need nearly four planets if we all lived like you, and you're not even the worst. Yes, thank Mate, you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope right. well. Never yeah. See you again. <laughs> Taxi. Back in Cornwall, it's all go in our local pub. This loft insulation is made from recycled glass bottles. Cheers for that. <laughs> and it's one of the best ways to cut your heating bills. Hang on a second, we're slaving away in the attic. While well, the brains behind the project is waiting for his lunch. All right, Mr Milner. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Lucky Jim. I have no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> it is lunchtime. That's why we're drinking beer now. We've been here a while, honestly. Right, mate, come on, talk to me. What are we going to do? It seems that the biggest problem you've got in that cellar 
is the fact that you've got a heating source in there that you really don't want. And you've also got halogen light bulbs, and they're giving about 70% right. heat out, you know, 30% light. I need to see. If we can get rid of, we can get other light bulbs that aren't going to give that kind of heat away. And if we can kind of get those areas sorted, that should start to reduce your fuel bills. It's quite sharp on the left. First, we're moving the ice machine so the air conditioner in the cellar won't be working overtime anymore. That could save Steve £200 a year. We're putting it in the chilly back kitchen where it might actually warm things up a bit. There we go. Just eat fleece off, man. <laughs> Sorry, this is getting warm in here. The attic insulation is nearly complete, but don't forget that you can't just add a load of insulation in a loft without thinking about ventilation. You need a good airflow to avoid condensation, which could, horror of horrors, rot your roof frame. Oh, this is a fantastic job, Lee. Well done, mate. It's going to save me a lot of money. And the planet. And the planet. I can talk all day long about things like loft insulation. But when it comes to being sensitive to the subject of death, I'm not your man. Over to Lauren. Flight Sergeant Gary Andrews died on the 2nd of September 2006, along with 13 others, when their RAF Nimrod crashed in Afghanistan. Most of the crew were from Moray in the north of Scotland. He was funny. He was just one of those people that was constant. You know, he was there, um, and you thought he would always be there. Gary was one of Ginny Slater's best friends. And I came in and um, my husband was on the phone, um, obviously quite distressed. Um, and, and I, you know, obviously immediately knew that something was wrong. And he just passed the phone to me and it was Gary's dad. And he just said, um, Gary's dead. Um, he's been in a plane crash. Can you go and see Christina? They had always joked together about being buried in a cardboard box under a tree on a Scottish hillside. Now Gary's wife needed Ginny to make it happen. She found a place to bury Gary close to the River Spey and discovered that it wasn't such an unusual idea. It's perfectly fine, as far as I'm concerned as a Christian minister, for the worship to take place in the church. And then for us to go from this place to an eco-burial that seems to me to be a perfect hole as to how we should approach the business of life and death and eternal life beyond it. So this is it round here? Yeah. Yeah, he's just, he's just down here. And, uh, and this is his view. And it was actually chosen because of this tree. Um, his wife chose it because she loved that tree. Obviously, this must have affected you profoundly, Ginny, but has it changed your plans for, you know, your own, your own burial at some point? Oh, yes. Um, I was adamant that I was going to be next to my nana um, at Belly Cemetery, you know, near Fochabers, and now I'm going to be here. <laughs> so uh, you've got, oh, you've got a that. plot here already? Yes, yep. Not only has Ginny bought a family plot here, she's gone one step further. Have you thought about, you know, the, co the coffin? I've already got the coffin. Really? Where, where is it? It's uh, at my house. Ready? The girls um, have drawn on it and, and written on it. No, hang on, right, so you're having, <laughs> you're having an afternoon of activities. <laughs> No, let's not read a book. Let's get the coffin out and decorate. How did that happen? How did that come about? Um, I wanted them to be involved so that when the time does come, they look at it and they go, oh, I remember when we did that, that was so funny. So they've got really good, happy memories. Just to make this clear, she is as fit as a fiddle. I don't think I have any other friends that have done this. 
Wowzers. Oh look, we decorated with a It's heavier packet. than you'd think though. It's not just like it's, well, no, not just it's like a big shoe. It's box. substantial, it's substantial. Oh, really? Some people have got no respect. You know what I mean? <laughs> Ginny's so impressed that it's now her line of work. What do you think? It's pretty, yeah. The girls have done a great job. Yeah. I have my reservations. <laughs> I still think it's a bit weird. <laughs> What's your reaction to that? Oh horror. Really? It's a cardboard coffin. Does it make sense to you? No, I think it's a good idea. This is about, um, I would say, a fifth of the price of a normal coffin. Is it cheaper? Much cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there you are, see? <laughs> Thank you. Many of the Scots so far concerned with price. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to generalise, obviously. <laughs> I would say that's a better idea. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's good. Well, I want a nice oak coffin. You want a nice oak coffin now? Each to their own. Thank you. I didn't know much about cardboard coffins and natural burials before I came here to visit Ginny. I won't be decorating my own coffin anytime soon, but I do understand now why she cares so much. We keep saying it's not easy being green, but to me, this doesn't seem like too difficult a choice to make. And you know what? Ginny's friend Gary is at rest in a truly beautiful place. Hello. I'm up in London checking how Chris and Jay are getting on with their ecovation. The clock's ticking, so I assume they're up the scaffolding working. Two months on and they're well insulated. Got the veg garden in place and a rainwater harvester to provide free water for the loo and washing machine. Gosh, it's nice and high up here, isn't it? Hey, Jay, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you, mate. Today, it's time to sort out the hot water. Chris and Jay have decided to install solar panels. Oh, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say, that's not south facing, is it? No, I knew you were going to ask this. Question. Hold on, we always do this. <laughs> that's Which south. Which way is south? It's over there, isn't it? Right, OK. And these aren't yeah, south facing south. Yeah. But the best thing about this is that even though it's not a south facing roof, they will gain so much solar gain because we can adjust them ever so slightly to maximise the amount of uh, energy that they capture. Also, but we can also increase the size of them so we're getting the same yield as if they were south facing. And a little bit smaller. And you can imagine, this is how these things which are designed to capture the, the solar gain, yeah. how immediately they're going to start to warm up. And it's going to feel fantastic when I'm sitting in a bath full of water that's been heated for free. They'll provide masses of hot water in the summer, but not enough in the winter, so Chris and Jay have another green trick up their sleeves. The heart of their system is this ultra-modern air source heat pump. Come on, madam, show me the heart of your system. <laughs> It'll work with the solar panels to get the water up to temperature, no matter what the weather. Essentially, this is a unit. You put in one a unit of electricity and um, it will take the, the heat from the air and it will compress that, right by, thereby raising the temperature of it, and it gives out about four, well, three to five units of uh, heat. Sounds and like magic. The other things are, if you're on a green tariff, you're using green electricity, so that's uh, you know, yeah. electricity from a renewable source. Plus, this type of technology has a low CO2 emission. It's using the air around mm. us to heat our house, mm. rather than gas or other fossil fuels. While we've been chatting, the guys have connected up the panels and they're plumbed into the water tank. Let's yeah. go and put it on. Yeah. Okay, go on. Absolutely. Go for it. Go for Are you it. Ready? Are we going okay. To see steam? Probably. A oh, bit of bit of air coming through. Oh, that's hot already. Oh, go on, Jay. It's hot. Hot. Look at the steam coming off. We don't oh, need this. That's lovely. Look. Look at, oh, it's a sauna. Oh. Okay. Let's see what the temperature says. 48 degrees. Lovely and warm. That's not warm. That is hot. <laughs> The whole shebangs cost them £9,000. How does that compare with a conventional setup? 
Well, we worked out that if we'd gone with a condensing boiler, that would have cost us about three and a half thousand pounds yeah. all in. And we spent nine, so that's about six, five and a half thousand pounds. Five and a half, yeah, difference. it's different. But the good thing about that is, is that we're actually, when we did the calculations, we're saving 500 pounds a year on our bills. So five and a half thousand pounds was the difference. 500 pounds a year, line. that's 11 years. Um, and we've paid for the whole system. And if energy prices go up, their payback time will come down. Back at the pub, Jim's got some more money-saving ideas. Try these in. Same light output, but these are 2.5 watts. The right, old Matt. ones were 50 watts. Light right. bulbs. Let's give it a try. Go on, get them in there. Thinking about it, you're probably going to save over a year just on one light fitting, which is that one, probably about £100 a year. Ooh, close but no cigar. <laughs> right, this is a new eco pull table. What have you done? We've sprayed the interior of the of the light fittings yeah. and then changed the bulbs to um, lower fittings, energy bulbs. Yeah, so so what sort of what have we got in here now? About 60 watts? We're doing 60 watts now instead of 300. Steve didn't like the glow from his low energy light bulbs, so he painted them. So, so there's a warmer colour. How, how do you know which colour to use? Well, I just took the first tin off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. Any complaints? No complaints. Good effort. And you've got these all around the pub now? We're starting to put them around the pub. Good man. And, you know, the savings that are coming through this, you know, you, you sort of see them adding up now, can't you? This room alone, you know, what, 500 watts saved in here? Yes. 10 pence an hour? Yep. It's quite nice, isn't it? Over a year, it's going to save us an awful lot of money. Being green makes financial sense for any business. And even if you don't own the property, simple changes can still save you money. For more ideas, go to bbc.co.uk slash bloom. <laughs> so what do you reckon is the best of the things you've done, or the best project you've done? Definitely, for the, for the pub, it's been the, the loft insulation. Do you feel a difference? It, a, a lot different, because I actually do sleep better. I think we could probably do a mathematical calculation as to how much energy you're going to save. Shall I get my calculator? No. Nope. <laughs> Stay, bear with me, Jim. Listen, watch this, watch this, yeah? If that's your bill for last year, yeah? If I'm thinking really hard here, I reckon this is how much you're saving. <laughs> I reckon that's your saving. Okay, then. What do you reckon? Jim's doing his calculation now. I obviously am slightly more optimistic than Jim. Good. <laughs> but he still reckons I should save us there. <laughs> I reckon we've saved Steve more than a thousand pounds a year. Now that's worth drinking to. Cheers, Steve. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers mate. Thanks, gentlemen, for your help. My pleasure. Next week on It's Not Easy Being Green, we build a space age greenhouse. This is probably the most complicated flat pack you have ever seen. Children's presenter Sam and Mark look green, sound green. I have grown my own veg this year. That's true. Well done. That looks good, true. man. But will they survive the eco test? John Kay finds out how to get solar panels past the planners. What a view. And how not to. And Lauren gets a bit demanding. I want fashion, but I want eco-fashion. And I want it now. You can catch up with Dick and the series so far on the BBC iPlayer. Next on BBC Two, a star chef in the making, John and Greg put six more hopefuls to the ultimate test. And later at nine, what really drives world economies and the prices we pay for everything? The City Uncovered with Evan Davis. 